Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you today. I'm Allison Bernstein and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Translational Neuroscience at the Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. But I'm here today not because I'm a neuroscientist, but because I'm a co-founder of an organization called Simons. Simons is an educational nonprofit and our goal is to help people find evidence-based information and resources. This is mostly through our lens of being mothers, but we cover a much broader range of topics than just parenting and kids. I've been doing science communication since 2015 when I started a Facebook page under the pseudonym Mommy PhD. Initially, I was doing a lot of debunking of myths and misinformation, but as I spent more and more time in the social media SciComm space, it became clearer and clearer to me that errors in risk perception underlie much of the public misunderstanding of science, and that the way that we use social media further distorts and exacerbates these errors that we make. I started thinking about science communication as risk communication. And this seems especially true to me for public health communication when the goal is to get someone to change their behavior, whether it's quitting smoking or wearing a mask. Now, humans are intuitively terrible at assessing risks in our own lives. Our innate mental shortcuts bypass our logic and rationality and complicate our ability to make informed decisions. Some examples. We are bad at assigning risks to long-term risks and benefits, and we have an innate tendency to focus on the short-term, things that are happening immediately, and we don't think so much about things that are going to happen in a month or a year. We overestimate the risk of the unfamiliar and what we don't understand, and we also underestimate the risk of things that are familiar to us. Similarly, we underestimate risks of natural hazards and overestimate risks of man-made hazards. We also neglect to consider the risk of doing nothing or the alternative. We also worry more about risks that we can't control and tend to overlook risks that we can control. So these natural errors in risk perception are compounded when people don't have access to good information and as we all know, many media outlets do not do a great job of accurately reporting health risks. And this bias in media reporting that we see is also filtered and simplified and amplified through social media algorithms. So these algorithms and our own behavior and preferences on social media create these echo chambers and net networks um, and communities on social media. Um, so these communities on social media that traffic in pseudoscience and misinformation take advantage of all of these biases and risk perception and they create spaces that reinforce people's fears but also provide a safe and comforting environment where people's fears and ideas are validated. So we end up with this chain, chain of exaggeration where pe what people are seeing is disconnected from the actual scientific findings and the actual information that they need. So each step in this chain amplifies the fear, loses the nuance, and loses the context of where the information comes from. So what this means is that people are not seeing an accurate representation of the science. And even when science, scientists and public health agencies are putting out good information, it's not necessarily what people are actually seeing from the news and on their social media accounts. So when you add this onto uncertainty unknowns and unknowns surrounding coronavirus, this is even more exaggerated. Uncertainty is difficult to cope with, and people feel uncomfortable thinking about decisions with such a high level of uncertainty. Even worse, the pressing nature of the coronavirus pandemic takes this problem to a whole new level, because we can't wait for certainty in this case. We have to act and make decisions before we know all the answers. So we've taken this already muddy landscape and added in a high dose of uncertainty and urgency. And now we have a full-blown COVID infodemic. Alongside the pandemic, this is a massive information problem. When I was invited to speak for this event, I was already thinking about everything I've just talked about. I was thinking about how we can nudge people's behavior to have better sharing habits on social media, and how we can just in general encourage people to think about risk in a way that bypasses those mental shortcuts that I talked about at the beginning. And I think that gaming brings a really unique set of tools to this problem. So I'd like to close with just a few thoughts to consider as you think about how to use games to both teach and nudge behavior. First, there are a lot of creative ways to do science communication. On our SciMoms blog, we have Lego comics. I write parody songs about risk perception. Um, so we can all find ways to translate what you are passionate about into science communication. You don't have to be a scientist to do this. You just have to feel passionately about it. I think that games have a really great potential to break past all of the noise in this communication landscape in a way that all the fact-checking sites in the world just can't do. Second, in public health communication, the goal is to change behavior. 
In this case, the precision of the information is less important than the significance of the information. And this doesn't mean that we sacrifice accuracy, but people don't necessarily need all the details to know what is important and what they need to do. So this is especially important when the science is uncertain and evolving, like it is with COVID. You don't need someone to understand every last bit of nuance about droplet or aerosol spread or asymptomatic and presymptomatic spread, right, to understand why it's important to wear a mask, to watch your distance, and to not gather indoors. We need to do those things because we know that they help, regardless of whether we have precise scientific evidence about the exact mechanism of disease transmission. Now, I love nuanced explainers, and I will read them all day, but they have their place and they aren't always the best way to get people to make a behavior change. So please keep this in mind as you develop games and think about how to do this. And you don't need to get so bogged down in the scientific details of this. Finally, games are really about risk benefit calculations. So they provide this unique opportunity to get people to think about risk in an appropriate way and help them learn to get past these innate biases that they have. So in our house, we play a lot of board games. And when we play board games, we talk about this a lot with our kids. For example, just because you've rolled a four in Catan for the past four turns doesn't mean you are any more or less likely to roll a four again. So we're talking a little bit about probability there and independence of events. Um, or the alternative to playing this magic card is not zero. The alternative is what you lose based on the alternative. And that was one of those biases that I mentioned at the beginning. So gamers are used to thinking about these things at every turn of a game. And these can be seen as ways to train people to think about risk, but we don't usually think about it that way. So keep that in mind, and I'm wondering how we can take advantage of that to use games to help people think about risk in a less biased way. And with that, I will close, and I'm so excited to see what you guys come up with and what comes out of these, this event. Good luck.